right, so this video is entitled Litigation, and we're going through these slides. So the court system begins with a question. Does this case belong in federal or state court? And um, the fun part about this class is we're not going to discuss that. <laughs> it's uh, that's that's actually can get pretty complicated. There are a lot of rules to decide it. If ever you're going to court, the the court will tell you, or your attorney will tell you. And uh, let's just leave it that that was several days of discussion in law school. But once you've decided if you're in uh, which court you're in, then the series of rules depends on what type of law we're discussing. Public law are laws that deal with the obligations of the government. So, for example, a good example of a public law is how you become a citizen. So the rules around how to become a citizen of the United States, those are public laws, what your government has to do. Private laws are laws that regulate activity between people. So my, I have three dogs and they bark in the backyard and our city ordinance or law around that is an example of a private law. Substantive law is probably what you think about when you think of the law. So an example of a substantive law is um, that my neighbor has the right to live in a house that doesn't have constant barking laws, uh, dogs, and so there are rules around that. Procedural law, though, is how the court is going to go about its business. So procedural laws is a big part of what lawyers do. Who can testify? What evidence can a court consider? Um, those are procedural, procedural issues. So a substantive question might be, is this the gun used in the murder? Is this the blood of the victim? And a procedural question would be, is this first degree or second degree murder that we're considering? Civil law is what we'll do this semester primarily. Civil law is a group of laws in which a person is harmed, but society as a, as a whole isn't harmed. So if we go back to my barking dog, in that example, I'm harmed because it's impacting uh, the way I have my household and my dogs. And my neighbors are harmed if my dogs are barking incessantly, right? Um but that's not impacting society as a whole. The state of Colorado isn't harmed because my dog barks. Uh, the fabric of our nation isn't harmed because my dog barks. So in a civil case, you have a plaintiff and a defendant. So the plaintiff files the case. That's the complaining party. And the defendant responds to the case. And I wrote those out. And I also wrote the two shortcuts that I use frequently like on a if I'm writing about them and that you're welcome to use and uh, the damages options if uh, the defendant is found guilty the damages options are money restitution maybe if my dogs have torn down the fence I have to put the fence back up and perhaps an equitable remedy which we'll discuss in a different slide so I'm going to let that go for now Juries are usually not convened in a civil law unless there is a statute that permits it. And the burden of proof is preponderance of the evidence. So what does that mean? The plaintiff has to prove by the preponderance of the evidence that these facts are true and that a civil law has been broken. Juries all the time ask for a definition of this. And people in, in school ask. And judges hate giving a percentage. But it's at least 51%. So it has to be probably the most likely scenario. What is most likely to be true. And the plaintiff has to prove it. The defendant doesn't have to prove anything. Criminal law is laws that harm society and a person. So murder, in my other case with the gun, 
is a criminal law because it not only harms the victim, but it harms the entire fabric of society to have murder occur. It makes us all more fearful and it has other unpleasant consequences. So in a criminal case, the person harmed doesn't sue, the state sues, and it's called the prosecution. And they, so it's the state itself who is ha having the case against the defendant. And the defendant is, of course, the person who has been accused of this crime. Juries are guaranteed in criminal cases under the Sixth Amendment, although the uh, defendant has the right to waive that and, um, and often does. And the burden of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt, so it's a different phrase, isn't it? And it's the duty of the state or the prosecution to prove. Now, if preponderance of the evidence is a, at least 51% and the most likely uh, outcome, what is beyond a reasonable doubt? Again, judges don't like giving a percentage to it. But it's up there in the 90s, probably, 90%, 99%, that, that this is almost for sure the way that, that these facts played out. And that's for the jury to determine what is beyond a reasonable doubt. Again, it is for the state or the prosecution to prove the case. The defendant doesn't have to do, doesn't have to do that. So, in order for a criminal law, uh, a criminal case to result in a guilty verdict, we have to prove three things. First, the conduct must have been illegal at the time of the commission of the crime. So, let's look at um, abortion. Let's pretend in Colorado that abortion is legal, which it is, and that Fatima has an abortion at 10 weeks. And that a week after Fatima has her abortion, Colorado determines that abortion is now illegal. Well, can Fatima be arrested for the crime, the new crime, of having an abortion? Well, the answer is no. She had the abortion when she had the right to do that, when it was legal. Does that make sense? All right. That's one piece that we have to prove, the prosecution has to prove in a criminal case. The, uh, the next piece is actus res. That's a legal uh, Latin word phrase that means that, that the defendant voluntarily committed this crime. And perhaps the most famous case of that happened about three years ago, maybe more now, where a gentleman is a pizza delivery man. He went to a house to deliver the pizza. The house, it was a setup, and there were terrorists, um, domestic U.S. terrorists in the house. They strapped him up with explosives and then forced him to rob a bank with all these explosives strapped to his body. He did not have actus res. He did not voluntarily commit that crime of robbing that bank. He was forced to do so because of the terrorist act that was done against him. Mens rea is the last piece, and mens rea is Latin that means that the defendant intended to commit this illegal act, that the person had the mindset to commit it. This most often comes into play with children, and you see that a lot. There's a case that's been going through the courts where several girls in middle school middle school age, had become obsessed with Slender Man, which is a character in, a, in an online game, and then they horrifically beat up and stabbed a classmate, thinking that they were doing this in deference to Slender Man. Mens rea in this case is going to be a huge issue. Can 11-year-old girls, do they have the capacity to intend to commit this act? And so anytime you see a child being charged as an adult, that's a mens rea question. The defenses in a criminal case, that is to say that you committed the act, but you um, uh, lack actus reus or mens reus, 
Well, innocence, which means you didn't do it, right? Insanity. Insanity is a mens rea case, right? Um, you don't have the mental capacity to intend to commit a crime. Entrapment is a actus reus question that you did not, you were not voluntary in your activity. And duress is also an actus res, that you were forced to do it, just like that pizza delivery man. When a business is found guilty of a criminal law, they can have fines imposed, and those fines would be paid to the government, and, and then the government would determine if they would be um, given back to the victims or if the government will keep it. They can imprison the employees, put them in jail, or they can put the business under a compliance program where they oversee their actions. And we'll look at compliance programs down the semester a bit, and we look at OSHA and the ADA. Here are some examples of business crimes that you read about in the news. Embezzlement, of course, is um, the removal of personal property which has been entrusted to someone for use for your own personal gain. So if I take this computer that I'm recording on, this is a CCD computer, if I take this and use it take it away from the business and use it to start up my own competing school that would be embezzlement money laundering that money laundering is a process where um, cash from an illegal activity is concealed in ownership or control or location to disguise the fact that the money was acquired illegally so a uh, case of that that's fairly recent is with Costco where drug dealers will sell drugs all night and of course then they, now they have a lot of cash and that cash was obtained illegally so if you take it to the bank and put it in the bank maybe somebody will ask questions so what they do is they'll go to Costco and buy cigarettes and so now they have laundered their money so instead of having all this cash that you can't put in the bank, they have all these cigarettes, and then they sell the cigarettes, cigarettes, and the money has been laundered. Fraud is the deliberate use of deception to secure an unfair or unlawful gain. So fraud would be if I lied to you and said, uh, you're, you're selling your car, you're selling a Mazda, and I lied and said, well, they're about to have a um, recall on Mazdas, and no one's going to buy them anymore because the recall is so serious and you became scared and sold it to me at a tremendous discount that would be fraud um, and larceny is essentially theft taking away someone's property okay so the court progression so now we know what kind of law we're in and we're ready to start going to court it always begins with a trial court and then up, it can go to appeals or to the Supreme Court. And let's go through this one at a time. A trial court or the court of original jurisdiction is where the, the original complaint is heard. So it's important to, to understand that trials are very expensive. If you go to trial in a sense, in a business sense, you've already lost. You've spent the money on the attorney, the, you've lost the time and energy for the trial, so instead of working on your business, you're working on preparing for the trial. There's an enormous sinkhole of effort already put into the, to the case. The courts know that, so there's a lot of hurdles in place, and the hurdles are in place to prevent you from going to court. That sounds a little backwards, but the reasoning is, is if you know all the facts before we go to court, if everyone knows everything, you'll settle. You'll figure out another solution. So there's a lot of steps before you can get into your trial court, and those steps are intended to um, settle cases. So what happens is you have pleadings. The plaintiff issues a complaint. This is what happened. That complaint is given to the defendant in what's called service, and then the defendant responds, and that's the beginning. 
you can um, have two motions on that on that complaint on that initial round. One is a motion to dismiss, and that is a pleading that says even if all the facts are true, even if everything the plaintiff says is true, there is no way for the plaintiff to win. So what would be a motion to dismiss? Let's go back to the to uh, the barking dog case. And remember, I had suggested that perhaps my dogs damaged the fence. Let's say that there's a one-year statute of limitations in, in Colorado for damaged fences. So my dogs knock over part of the fence, and a year and a half later, my neighbors sell the house to a new family, and they sue me for the destruction to the fence. Well, they're right. My dogs destroyed the fence. So all I can say as a defendant, all those facts are true. My dogs did do it. You're right. But you only had one year to file the case. It's been 18 months. So now we're going to dismiss that case. And that's a motion to dismiss. A motion for summary judgment is a pleading that says that even if all the facts are true, the way the plaintiff has decided them, there is only one legal question in dispute, the answer to which is so obvious that we don't need a trial. So uh, in that case, let's say that the, um, so with my barking dogs, that the, they're suing me just because my dogs are barking. And they're saying that I haven't done anything and they continue to bark. So the one legal question is, are my dogs barking persistently over the course of the day? If I have a video camera out and I can prove that my dogs are never barking persistently, let's say persistently, persistently in the law is for at least 20 minutes straight, and that they go out and bark every once in a while and then come back in, but there's no 20 minute period where they're persistently barking. That's the only legal question. It's the answer to that is obvious. Dismiss the case. If the case survives all of that, so you have the pleadings, there's no motion, we go into a phase called, called discovery. Now the point of discovery is to discover all of the facts before the trial. There can be no surprises at trial. So when you see in the TV or in the movies surprise evidence, that's not actually permitted in real life. Discovery is intended to make the trial super boring because we already know what's going to happen. And they take different forms. Uh, an interrogatory is written questions. So I can give you a whole bunch of written questions and you have to answer them, type them out. That's under oath. So you're swearing that what you say is true in an interrogatory. And those questions can be, they don't have to be even directly related to the, to the trial. They can be a very broad range of questions. Remember, we're trying to keep you from the courtroom. So if I make you a little uncomfortable and I'm asking questions that are a little disquieting, maybe you'll choose to settle. A deposition is an oral question. So you go in and the opposing attorney asks you a million questions while you sit there. A production mandate is when they ask for records, ask for your employment record, ask for a medical record, ask for the video that you've been making of your barking dogs. A subpoena is when they're uh, demanding that another person come and do an interrogatory or a deposition. So maybe they are going to subpoena my daughter to, so that she can talk about the dogs and if they bark. And an examination would be that you're ordered to undergo some sort of examination. So it could be a medical exam or a psych eval, or it could be that uh, the, a plant is going to be examined, a business factory will be examined to see if there's any evidence of misconduct. Then after all the discuss discovery is happening or during this discovery, there's even more pleadings. There's the motion to compel. So if I think you, I gave you a 40-page interrogatory and you only answered the first five page pages, I can go to the court and file a motion to compel and force you 
to answer the rest. And the judge can even make you sit in his chambers and answer them. There's a protective motion. So if, if um, there's a lawsuit and one side believes that the other side is making unreasonable requests, so they're requiring that they see 14 different doctors and it's going to be super expensive, they can file with the court a protective motion saying this is getting out of hand, it's costing so much money, I can't get justice. And there's in-camera inspection. In-camera is a legal term that means that just the judge gets to look at it. So an in-camera inspection, let's say that there, um, my neighbor is forcing a psych eval on me because he thinks I'm crazy. Um, and I don't want him to see it because, I don't know, uh, I was abused as a kid and I don't want them to know that. So I will ask the judge to do an in-camera inspection. I'll go ahead and have that discovery, that exam. So I'll do my piece. And then I'll say, judge, you look at this and only show the other side, the opposing attorney, only show her what she needs to see. Don't show them everything because parts of this is private or none of their business. If you pass all of that, then we can start talking about a jury. And as we already discussed, whether or not you have a jury is, is a question depending on the law, depending on the statutes. If you do have a jury, the jury will be de determined by what's called a voir dire. And that is a process in which uh, a lot of people are called into the courtroom and questioned by the attorneys and they get culled down to 12 jurors. So in voir dire, you are asked, and you might have experienced this, you're asked a great deal of different kinds of questions, and the attorneys can decide whether or not to let you stay to be a jury member or to challenge you, that is to say, to ask the judge to remove you from the jury. There's two reasons that you can be challenged. You can be challenged for cause. That means there's a really good reason this person shouldn't be a juror. In the case on the Aurora shootings, the, the prosecution asked the judge to allow a challenge for cause to be if someone was opposed to the death penalty. So if a jury said, I could never ever convict someone to be put to death, even if they were guilty, that the attorney could then have them removed from the jury. So that's how a challenge for cause happens. There's also peremptory challenges, and each attorney is given a certain number of them by the judge. That could be two, that could be a hundred. It depends on the case. And that means that the attorney can, it's like a, like a, a card, like a get out of jail card. They can just hand it to the judge and say, I choose to remove this juror, and I don't need to tell you why, because I'm giving you this peremptory challenge card. Um, sometimes that... They remove juror, potential jurors because they think they see a racial bias, but they can't prove it, or because um, they talked to an expert who said, in this case, we think Hispanic women would be unduly biased to find guilt. So then they'll use their preemptory challenge cards to remove Hispanic women. It's a little bit magical thinking, actually. All right. So now we're in the court, which is, means we've already spent a whole lot of money, and it's already been a tremendous drain on your business. And there's two kinds of questions that can be answered in the trial court, questions of fact and questions of law. And that's the substantive and procedural, right? So questions of facts are those substantive laws. Questions of law are those procedural laws. So a fact is, do I have a dog? Can my dog bark? Has does he still have a vocal cords? Um, a question of law would be, what is the statute of limitations for these kinds of complaints? Or in a murder trial, is this the gun? Is this the blood? And then a question of law would be, is this murder or manslaughter? You have opening statement. You've seen this in TV. You've seen this in movies. Both sides have an opening statement. Then they examine people. Uh, direct is when the friendly attorney, the attorney on the side that you're representing, talks to you, and across is when the opposing attorney talks to you. Then they have a closing argument, 
And those opening statements and closing arguments are like stories. The, the attorney is telling the jury or telling the judge a story to try to convince them. Then the jury is given instructions from the judge. So both sides of the case, both attorneys, um, say to the judge, these are the instructions we want to give. The judge decides and says, okay, in this case, you can consider insanity, but you can't consider duress. You can consider first and second degree murder, but you can't consider manslaughter. The judge will give those instructions to the jury. The jury goes into the secret room and deliberates and then renders a verdict. All of that you know. Who can appeal? In a, that means I don't like the decision. So let's pretend we're back to the uh, barking dog case and I was found guilty and I'm going to have to pay a fine and I don't want to. So I want to appeal. I don't think it's true. I think my video proves it's not persistent. In a civil case, like in the dog barking case, um, either the plaintiff or the defendant can appeal. In a criminal case, only the defendant can appeal. So if the state loses, then the case is over. But you can only appeal questions of law. So um, in my barking dog case, you can't prove, do I have a dog? Does he bark? Those are questions of fact. You can only appeal the question of law. Did the statute of limitations, was it expired? Was it persistent? That is to say, for at least 20 minutes. And then in the appellate court, there's no trial. What happens in the appellate court is that um, the two attorneys will go and will talk uh, to a group of judges, a panel, and it's always an odd number so you don't have a split decision, and it can be three or it can be up to nine judges in the appellate court, depends on which court it is. And the um, there's no new evidence, no new witnesses, no new motions. Rather, each side has a certain amount of time to present their case. If you've ever seen one of these appellate courts, it's a pretty interesting um, exercise. The, uh, the attorney will start talking and then immediately be interrupted by the judges who have very specific questions they want answered because everyone's already read everything. So the judges know the question that they're trying to answer. The appellate court has three choices what they can do. They can uphold the decision. They can say the lower court, the trial court got it right, and everything stands. They can reverse the decision. They can say the trial court got it wrong, and we're going to change that decision. Or they can remand the case. If they believe there are questions of fact that still need to be answered, then they remand the case back to... Um, the trial and you have a whole nother trial and all those costs you have again so you start over again if you still don't like the decision that's been rendered you can appeal to the Supreme Court every state has a Supreme Court and the federal government has a Supreme Court um, but you're not guaranteed this appeal you have to write what's called a writ of certiori. That is to say, you have to write a letter saying, this is why I want you to hear the case. And then the, the Supreme Court gets to decide whether or not they're going to respond to that writ. And so they can say, yes, I'll hear the case, or no, I won't. Um, and we had that experience not that long ago here in Colorado, um, again with gay marriage, where we had appealed to the Supreme Court saying, the appellate court found that our constitution, constitutional amendment banning gay marriage was against the federal constitution for equal protection. And that was appealed to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court did not respond with a writ. They, did, they, they said, nope, we're not going to hear it. And so it ended with the appellate court, which is why gay marriage is now legal in Colorado. If I, in my dog barking dog case, if I go to the Colorado Supreme Court and they agree to hear the case and they uphold the decision, so I'm still guilty, I can then appeal to the federal Supreme Court. I can't imagine they care about barking dogs, but in, in my case, let's say they do. And so you do have that extra step that you can always take. And that's it for litigation. Thanks.